Hello. Hello. I would like to welcome you to this webinar, which focuses on a new report released today on transitions from early childhood to primary school. This webinar will present the main policy challenges and provide pointers for future policy development in this area. There will be a question and answer session after the presentation. You may send any questions you have to Eric Magnuson using the chat function of WebEx or using Twitter with using the hashtag, hashtag OECD child. For your information, this webinar is being recorded and will be available from our website at www.oec.org forward slash edu in the next few days. I would now like to hand you over to Andreas Schleiter, Director of the OEC Directorate for Education and Skills, and Miho Taguma, Senior Analyst, and Eric Chabonnier, Analyst in the Early Childhood and Schools Division. Thank you so much, Rachel. This is a great moment. It's the first time that we actually publish a comprehensive set of indicators on early childhood education and care that allows solid international comparisons. And my thanks for this go to Eric Chabonnier and Miho Taguma, who are with me on this webinar, who spent years in compiling of the, all of this. But beyond that, we have also been able to do some really innovative analytical work that studies the very critical phase of how children progress from early childhood education and care to primary schooling. Let me first start with some, <coughs> some data on the context of all of this. And basically, so talking a little bit about the demographic landscapes and family structures that have changed so much. If you look back to the 1970s, uh, if you look actually at the situation today or 2014, you can see that fertility rates in most OECD countries are well below the replacement rate. Oh, but if you look at the picture in the 1970s, the world looked very different. And many families, there are many children. So we have a very different context for education uh, and care. We also see that uh, the children living in households with a sole parent um, <coughs> are more likely to be living in a jobless household, which is quite troubling. Uh, here on the chart, you can see the proportion of children who live in a jobless family. But now, when you look at the proportion of children with a jobless parent and sole parent families, that is so much larger. Uh, you can see in the United Kingdom, or New Zealand, Australia, Turkey, it's 50% or more. So there are many children that you know, are growing up in families where there is very little potential to actually take good care of them. The relevance for early childhood education and care from another perspective. And there is, of course, you know, the issue of women and paid work. If you look to the 1960s, you could see a typical curve like this in most countries, and this is just the OECD average. <coughs> uh, at young ages, there would be a higher rate of employment among women, but then 25 to 29, 30 to 34, and so on. That would be the age where many women have children. They actually drop out of the labor market, and later on, some of them go back. If you look at this in the 1980s, again, the curve had gone up. You know, employment generally had grown, particularly for younger women. Uh, also, many people... <coughs> in a kind of critical age going into employment. But now when you look at this today, the curve has really changed in nature. You can see a little bit lower employment rate for 20 to 24 year olds because simply women pursue high levels of education. But then actually once they get to the age of 25 to 29, actually consistent high employment rate. So it's another perspective, you know, demand because of employment uh, for child care service has risen quite steeply, and they all together explain why there has been so much happening in this space. You know, it's actually one of the uh, positive stories that we have about education, the very dramatic expansion of places uh, for children and childcare, and uh, the question therefore is shifting much more now towards the quality of those services and the relevance of them, and I want to talk about this. First, a few data points on, you know, the uh, power that early education has to help children get ahead, not just cognitively, but also socially, emotionally, also the power it has to bring a you greater know, level playing field for children by helping them with disadvantage. And uh, it's important to bear in mind that the long and short term benefits of early childhood education and care are really multidimensional. The first thing I want to show you is that 
learning science has actually shown that brain plasticity evolves you know, in quite typical patterns across age groups. You can see, for example, when you talk about you know, one to two year olds, that's where emotional control is particularly, uh, the brain is particularly sensitive to the development of those kinds of skills. And you know, a few years later, uh, peer social skills, numbers comes in, well, language is something that children learn already uh, before birth, and then you know, it goes uh, in a quite continuum into there. So there are different phases of the lifespan where we are particularly sensitive to acquiring different skills. And a lot of this teach actually in the early years highlighting the importance to actually nourish those kinds of potentials in the brains of children. We also see that early childhood education and care can make a particular impact on disadvantaged children. And those are often hardest to reach, but they can benefit most. Uh, not implausibly, because they often do not obtain the kind of stimulation that children from more advantaged families may have. So you can see for disadvantaged children, the rate of return, by this we mean, you know, the money that you might get back when uh, for every dollar you invest today. It's particularly high in early childhood schools as well, and then it sort of levels up off. Whereas for well-off children, the rate of return is high as well, but somewhat less. No, you look at this chart and it sort of highlights the importance why we should invest in particular to help the most disadvantaged children get the best early learning opportunities. Now, the reality is quite distant from this. Here you can see the a number of years that today's 15-year-olds have attended pre-primary school or early childhood education and care for at least two years. And of course, that's not today's early childhood education and care. That's the kind of care and education students, 15-year-olds today, got you know, back then. But it gives you sort of an indication how much it varied at that time across countries. But the picture I'm really sort of wanted to show you here is how big a gap there is between privileged schools and disadvantaged schools. When you go to privileged schools, you can see children typically have much more experience of early learning than children in disadvantaged schools. So in a way, unfortunately, you know why we have seen just before how much, how, 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 how great the importance is of early learning for disadvantaged children. The reality is that early childhood education and care often reinforces, not moderates, uh, social disadvantage because we have not yet developed the kind of quality services for the most disadvantaged that they really need and deserve. Here you can see just the performance advantage. Uh, you can see uh, again, you know, in, expressed now in these are four points. You can see children who had at least two years uh, of early childhood education experiences in many countries do 30 points better than those children who had not. And that's about the equivalent of a full school year. So that's quite a lot in terms of impact. You know, and, uh, it is larger, again, you know, uh, when you do not take into account social background, um, but um, that again just tells us that it uh, is particularly leveraging the talent of children from wealthy families. So, early childhood education is important from many perspectives and has multiple benefits. We also see that, uh, for example, this is not cognitive outcomes, this is child obesity. You can see on the horizontal axis the proportion of children under the age of three, so the very young, who are enrolled in formal child care, and on the vertical axis the percentage of boys who are estimated to overweight or be obese at the age 11. And you can see there is a negative cross-country relationship. You can see also, and this is sort of intuitive, the strong relationship between uh, maternal employment rates, you know, when the youngest child is under the age of three, and enrollment rates of children under the age of three in early childhood education care settings. It just shows how important it is that those places are available <coughs> to give the working mothers uh, the, the chances for them. You know. So multiple benefits, cognitive, social, emotional, benefits for children, benefits for families, and so on. Um, and that explains why most governments have actually done a lot to make fund enrollment 
open more daycare centers, open more schools, and now it's time to look, take a harder look at the quality of the services. So you could see one of the things I didn't mention before. You know, we need to ask ourselves why does the you know, impact of early childhood education and care on, for example, learning outcomes at the fever age vary so much across countries? You know? Has it to do with differences in the quality of services? Uh, how much variability there is within countries, between institutions. In fact, we know so little about the quality of the services of our youngest children compared to what we know about, you know, a few years later when they go to school. And part of the answer obviously lies in improving the work environment uh, for our teachers. Now, Let's talk about some of the kind of participation patterns. When you look at the enrollment of children under the age of three, you can see that's still quite patchy, and obviously families make different choices. You know, some families prefer to educate their children at home or to take care of them at home under the small ages. Uh, but you can see uh, we are talking about you know one third of children already being enrolled. When you look at uh, Three-year-olds, there you can see basically uh, their unit, uh, enrollment in a fair number of countries is getting close to universal. When you look at four years, at the red dot, and you can see sort of many countries are getting close to the finishing line. And then enrollment at the age of five, uh, basically you can say in the vast majority of OECD countries, we have at least nine and ten uh, <coughs> children at age five being in some form of preschool environment. So. Enrollment is at sort of the last stages, is quite universal, and in the earlier stages, there are a lot of differences across countries. So, for obviously, different reasons on this. Now, enrollment is only a very crude measure of participation. It becomes more interesting when you add intensity into the picture. No? Here you see on the horizontal axis enrollment rates of children under the age of three, no? and on the vertical axis, how many hours in a week they actually spend them. And you can see the two do not go together at all. Actually, countries are all over it. You can see if a fair number of countries, you know, like Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Luxembourg, Sweden, France, Portugal, Slovenia, uh, that are basically combining a high intensity with a high incidence. So lots of children go, and they all go for a pretty long time. But you have also, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, you take a country like the United Kingdom, where participation is moderate, but actually in, in the intensity hours are still very, very low. Now they're changing that in September here, doubling that provision that brings them about to the OECD average. Uh, but again, you know, there's a lot of variable in the intensity of participation among children. In most countries, expenditure per child is higher for the very youngest children. You can see that here by comparing the gray bars with the blue bars. But overall, for those children who go to an institution, actually, spending uh, in many countries is quite favorable. It comes, compares quite favorable with primary spending even. No? And, uh, <clears throat> so there is actually and also a growing uh, bulk of resources that has been invested on this, not just in absolute terms, but in a number of countries, even relative to spending its time. So, money. Uh, where does the money come from? No. Uh, this is actually a perhaps you know, not so intuitive chart. You can see the blue part representing the money that comes from uh, public purse taxpayers. And in the light blue, you can see money that comes from other private entities, you know, subsidies. And a gray part is about household expenses. <coughs> and you can see this is actually a number of countries still very, very large. Why do I say this is surprising? Because, you know, if I would show you this for primary or secondary schooling and would tell you, well, you know, you have to pay tuition in the order of, you know, 20 or 30 percent, you would get actually very... Um, a struggle. No, we don't do that. We make basically school education generally free in the OECD world. That's not the case in pre-primary education and early childhood education in care. There actually, the case for public investment is a lot stronger. <coughs> if you would look at this, you know, from the viewpoint of where does the public actually taxpayers get most of the return, you would argue for making 
you know, early childhood education and carefree, and maybe levy fees on university students or perhaps secondary students. So that what you can see here is a long tradition that basically early childhood education and care is only progressively becoming institutionalized, becoming a part of the public system, and still in many countries uh, parents are required to pay. In some of the uh, countries that vary, you know, fee structures vary by uh, by family income and family situation, and that's that's quite meaningful. You know, if you have to mobilize money, uh, mobilize it from those who can pay. So, um, and that's happening in a number of countries. But overall, significant private money going into this. We also see and that's also a distinguishing feature from primary education that actually a lot of the funds come from. Uh, local or regional governments right? in the area of schooling, sort of more centralized funding is dominant, whereas here in the area of early childhood education, here you can see many countries actually, uh, most of the initial uh, funds come from local governments. It's not a bad thing, it makes early childhood education and care very responsive to local needs, but it does raise challenges in terms of uh, coherence of the system. And I'm going to come back to this. This is, I think, an issue that we find all over, that uh, uh, early the early childhood education and care sector is still highly fragmented. It's not as integrated and cohesive when it, uh, as you would expect from, from schools or other uh, educational sectors where we have a clear picture of you know, what it takes to be a successful teacher, what the nature of the institutions are, what children learn, and so on. But, you know, a lot of this is actually happening, and what, one of the things that we have seen in our analysis that the sector is clearly shifting from just you know, more of the same to thinking harder about how to leverage the investment. Let me show you a couple of points on this. Uh, basically, what you can see here is that the uh, uh, <coughs> number of hours for which uh, countries provide free access for all sales. And uh, you can see in the case of you know, Slovenia, Kazakhstan, the Czech Republic, and Italy, it's 40 hours. So it's for more or less in a working day that uh, this is provided free. If you go to England, it's 15 hours. But that's sort of in, in Scotland, even lower than that. So it varies quite a bit across countries. I already mentioned, you know, England and Scotland are doing something about it. Uh, but still, entitlements. Uh, vary a lot. They also vary in terms of their conditionality. Those things are important to keep in mind. Now, another way of capturing resources is by looking actually how many children there are for every teacher. And you can see that this varies hugely across countries. Uh, we distinguish here pre primary education, that's the three years and older ones, and early childhood and education development of very young children. And you can see, <coughs> at least for pre-primary education, where we have data for most countries, uh, group sizes near enormous. Uh, if you are in Sweden and or in Australia, you talk about you know five children for a teacher. If you are in Chile and Mexico, you talk about 25 uh, children for a teacher. So there's a lot of differentiation. I should tell you here, I did not include you know other kind of stuff. Uh, in, the, in the centers, this is really a bit about the education component. But you can see a lot of variability, and that obviously reflects of quality. Now, you know, there are trade-offs and choices that countries need to make. You know, is it better to hire fewer teachers, pay them better, or you hire more teachers, at lower costs? You know, those are difficult choices that countries make, and what you can see here is that countries make them in very different ways, and we have still too little evidence to study, you know, what's the right group size, what's the right level of salaries, and so on, but this is just a good illustration of how much variability there is across countries. One of the interesting developments that we have seen over the years is that countries have actually done a lot to broaden the curriculum. If you look in 2011, for example, that's the blue bar, you could see Free unguided playtime, uh, was typically not part of the curricula. Ethics and citizenship very rarely. ICT skills didn't play much of a role, and neither did foreign languages. But you can see in 2015 things like foreign languages have become very popular among parents and are part of the curricula framework. 
Same as technology, assets, you know, play, and health and well-being. So there have actually been quite remarkable changes in the last few years in broadening curricula to sort of develop a more holistic view on what early childhood development should be. Now, you know, to be honest, this is what's on paper. We have very little of an idea to what extent those ideas are actually, you know, translated into food and quality provision in early childhood education and care. That's something that warrants further study, but at least there has been an attempt to broaden the curriculum frameworks. Now, I already mentioned that the key is obviously the quality of early childhood education and care can never exceed the quality of the people working. Workforce quality is really, really important. One of the things that we have seen actually that in the middle of the financial crisis, you could see in a fair number of countries actually salaries moving up. You look at Greece for understandable reasons, but there have been a huge you know, cut in the salaries of people. But also countries like England, like Portugal, like Scotland, like Italy, like Spain uh, have to make painful cuts in the salaries of those who make you know, a huge difference to our children in our society. Not everywhere. You can see on the right side countries where actually salaries have moved up, but the truth is that in many countries they're still not yet competitive with uh, primary school teacher salaries. You can see that on this chart here, and I show you two things. The blue bar shows you the salary salary differential. The longer the bar, the bigger the pay gap between a primary teacher and a pre-primary teacher. So the more of a disadvantage there is for pre-primary teachers in their salaries. And then the red and the green dots show you the level of training, the number of years of education for pre-primary and primary teachers. So when the green and the red dots are at the same place, it tells you there is actually an effort to give those pre-primary and primary teachers a similar level of education, a length of education at least. When there's a gap, uh, like, for example, in Slovenia, you can see you can get a pre-primary certificate after three years. If you want to become a primary teacher, you need to study five years. No? <coughs> so in some countries, there are gaps, but actually, this chart is pretty amazing because if we had done this analysis you know, a decade ago, we would have found huge gaps in most countries. So quality, there has been significant investment in raising the quality at least in terms of the length of education. Now, one thing that our report has found, and that's where we have actually devoted a lot of our studies, is that uh, we need to do a lot to sustain the benefits of early childhood education and care when students move into primary education. You can lose, uh, lose a lot of you know, knowledge that has been attained, and uh, what we have found is actually that there are many you know, artificial institutional barriers that we impose because we run institutions by different you know, ministries, government entities, uh, local providers. The, I mean, why does a primary teacher uh, not know all what the pre-primary teacher has learned about a child, particularly about a disadvantaged child? So if you have a wealthy child, the parents will always come to your school. For a disadvantaged child, you know, uh, uh, the one who took care of the child will know a lot about the child, but that information often doesn't make it into a primary school. Why do we pay primary teachers better than early childhood education and care staff? Now, there is no natural explanation. I mean, the only answer this really has is it's a way with all the assumptions. And meanwhile, we have learned so much about how children learn, how children grow, how the brain develops, that we can do a lot better than this, that we can actually develop much more smooth transitions, and that's really what our analysis show. This is just for the United Kingdom, but a good illustration of why both quality early childhood education and care and good primary school effectiveness matter. Now, basically what it looked at here is the mathematics scores of, of students at the end of primary school. And you can see where preschool quality was higher, this is towards the right side, the bars get longer. But their primary school effectiveness was high. That's in the light blue bars. The bars get even longer. So you can see basically primary schools, the quality of primary schools can amplify or comes through the quality of preschools. 
So you need to basically synchronize those two institutions really well in terms of professionalization, but also in terms of pedagogical paradigms, the kind of beliefs. You have a, you know, take the Swedish scenario, you have a group of five children taken care of by a teacher in the early childhood education care setting. And the next Monday, that child will sit in a classroom with 30 children, in, or 25 children in a Swedish classroom. Right? It's a different world. Before, the child was told, well, you know, you can play, you can experiment, you, you know, and suddenly the child is told, well, today you should listen to the teacher. There are a lot of artificial breaks, and that actually needs to be much better synchronized. What are the changes that come with those transitions? It's the type of activities that children engage in. It's the way in which, you know, teachers interact with them. It's the way their school looks like. The number of peers, the kind of rules and routines, a lot of change. Actually, the transition from early childhood education to primary school is a really big step for most children. And we also know that disadvantaged uh, children are more likely to struggle in that transition. They often tend to attend the lower quality ECC settings you know, and sports. We saw that in the PISA analysis. They are also more exposed to risk factors such as low teacher expectations, poor parent teacher interactions, and simply to have a less stimulating home environment. So, again, we need to redouble our efforts to reach out to the children who can benefit most. And, you know, that's not something that uh, we are just discovering now. We have actually seen in our report that countries have done a lot in this. So they, uh, you can see that reflected in policy documents, which have placed much greater emphasis on the need for smoother transitions. Uh, for example, in Austria and Denmark, Finland, Japan, Norway, Slovenia, so Wales in the UK countries that we studied, there was good evidence that actually curriculum documents are more integrated. <coughs> uh, we are also seeing that ministries of education take more of a responsibility for the whole of the early childhood education and care sector, you know, rather than dividing it up between, you know, this is an educational institution and this is a child care center. So I think there's a lot of effort being made to facilitate transitions. One of the things we also noticed that in the majority of countries, now there is a separate year or class the year before compulsory primary school where actually attention is devoted to preparing for this transition, and it's actually in 11 of the jurisdictions that we survey, compulsory. So that is another way how efforts are being made. Some countries have lowered the compulsory school age. That's something that you can have multiple views on. Uh, you know, in some cases, you take the case of Mexico, it was largely done because, you know, uh, to secure participation. In other countries, it was done to, you know, widen <coughs> other access and to reach out to uh, underserved groups. So there are different motives for this, but it varies across countries. Now in Sweden, you only need to go to school when you're seven, uh, even though many children, as you saw previously, are taken very well care of earlier on by institutions. And uh, in Hungary and Mexico, you start basically in a compulsory way at age six. So that there is as well. And then other transition measures, you know, there are open house days, parent information meetings, space days, there's information material for parents, support from specialists, exchange days, and other things that basically jurisdictions do to more or lesser extent. Here you can see just the percentage of countries that those things are offered. Uh, to facilitate transitions. Now, let's focus a little bit more on the substance. We've seen that the curricula are becoming more aligned between the pre-primary and primary levels. Uh, you can see that in over half of the countries, they are pretty well aligned. In a further 24%, they are fully integrated. That is a, a kind of cohesive kind of set of structures that extends across sectors. And then 22% where we could not find much of an alignment. Now, when I say alignment, that doesn't mean that we are schoolifying the primary education. It simply means that we are more articulate about the boundaries between the two sectors. It could mean, you know, making the last year of kindergarten a bit more like school and can mean making the first year of school a bit more like kindergarten. It just means that, you know, we try to make this as smooth as possible to think more about the learner than about the institutional provider. So I think it's an encouraging picture. This is something 
that countries take care of, at least on paper. Again, you know, we have very little of an idea yet uh, how much of that translation is in practice. I already mentioned efforts to, you know, broaden curriculum uh, coverage on ethics, on citizenship, on foreign languages. You can see that here again. Um, a part that is sort of less positive is that uh, there's still very heavy demands on early childhood education care teachers to <coughs> uh, teach, basically. They spend a lot of time with children, uh, have less time for other things. Now, on the one thing, you see, that's great. You know, you would want the teacher of your child to try to spend as much as possible with stuff. Now, but at the same time, we also know how important it is that uh, teachers do have the time for professional collaboration, for uh, preparation, for working with colleagues, to actually also design and frame new and good practice. So finding the right balance is important, and it's clear that it's not yet as favorable as it is in the case of primary schooling, and certainly not when we go to secondary school. So little time left for other things in teaching in many of the countries for which we have comparable things. Staff and parent collaboration is another aspect that we looked at. In preschool, it looks quite good. Uh, in uh, primary schooling, levels are a little bit lower. Um, and uh, it also changes by what you look at. For example, on the left side here, you can see the percentage where staff collaborate with parents by sharing child development records with the aim of supporting transition. So that's important. And uh, then other ways of collaborating uh, are a little bit less prevalent. But overall, you can say from the preschool side, there seems to be quite an effort to reach out to parents. From the primary side, that's the other part of the transition process, that's perhaps something that can still be strengthened in most of the systems. There are still a number of uh, important challenges uh, for making transitions more child-centered, better guided by pedagogical continuity, managed by better trained staff and also well-informed parental and community engagement. Let me just show you a few challenges. The first thing is that we saw is that there's still a lot of, you know, um, cross-level understanding of practices and approaches is still limited in a number of countries. Now, you have teachers, you know, who believe in very different things. You know, school teachers are more likely to believe in the subject and the subject matter teaching, whereas primary pre-primary teachers may have a more kind of broader notion about uh, child development and there is often you know very little in terms of communication opportunity. Often you can even say that there's not even a common language. No? People mean just very different things when they talk about education. We also see that reflected in disjoint pre-service training. You know, basically that uh, staff are educated in very different routes. And local autonomy, I mentioned that already, makes it often very hard to deliver pedagogical continuity. So we've also seen what good practices are. First of all is to create a shared view between uh, early childhood settings and schools on what transitions mean, bringing them together, together to think about you know, how to develop best and how they can best be supported by the different settings. Uh, to build a shared understanding on how children learn differently, uh, the kind of personalized uh, support that children need. <coughs> to strengthen collaborative practices between preschool and primary school teachers. Again, you know, that sounds so trivial, but it's so hard to do in practice. And sometimes, you know, we shoot ourselves in the foot by, you know, creating very kind of bureaucratic structures that are well meant to protect, you know, anonymity of information, but actually, um, hinders that very, very valuable information is passed on. Within a school, that's never an issue because teachers talk with each other, so they're free-flowing information. But when you talk about, you know, between the sectors, that information is still a scarce food for us. The pedagogical understanding, the better alignment of this, alignment of the working conditions of preschool and primary school teachers, to see how great the differences currently are, flexibility and responsiveness to individual communities. So those are practices where you find those things transition seem to be going better. And I want to just wrap up with five more lessons that we have taken from all of this. The first is uh, to take more care that schools are ready for children and not, you know, try to force children into some institutional structures that we invented many years ago. 
we also need to get rid of some common myths and misconceptions that are surrounding the transitions, uh, the fragmentation and lack of coherence in goals, uh, you know, or in curricula or pedagogical practices, the lack of cooperation and collaboration among the actors, whether are the people, the staff, the you know, community service, the policy level. And many of them are not uh, rooted in you know bad will or lack of time even. They tend to be rooted in different perceptions, different philosophies, different expectations of the actors. I already mentioned you know, the range of structural and informational roadblocks that actually inhibit cooperation and continuity. Encouraging local leadership is important, but that also needs to be backed up by clear national policy framework so it all fits into the coherent picture. And mainstreaming transitions into existing equity measures. And I'll leave it here so that we have enough time for your questions. Thank you very much. Interesting. Um, so, yes, thank you. Um, we have some questions indeed. Going back to what you were talking about good practice, um, do you think the country sets the right priorities when investing in EC, EC, early child and care? In terms of is there any ones that should be more focused on in your in that list? I think it's very hard to judge the sort of in a, in a broad brush. I think we could certainly say that. Uh, a lot has been done for broad curricula to think, think more carefully through how children learn and how they can be best supported. But uh, what you can clearly see that some things are at odds. You know, I mentioned already that you know we tend to you know levy more private uh, spending on parents when the children are very young when actually public money would make most sense. You know, we pay those teachers less when actually you know they may have the most difficult job and require the most you know advanced training. I think there are a lot of choices that uh, require further thought and consideration. A lot is on track, but I still think there are some anomalies, you know, uh, setting priorities and in managing information in, in the system where there is a lot that I think could be improved. But uh, uh, my colleagues, Neo and Eric, may also have you some. Yes, thank you, uh, Andreas. Yes, spending choices is one of the most difficult uh, issues for many countries. And in, in order for OECD to respond to this question, we really need to uh, pay attention, careful attention to varying ECEC situations that countries are facing, whether it is really still a combination of access and quality issues or affordability issues and the population background of the, the children, how many children are really in the disadvantaged situation, and whether the countries really want to boost the female labor participation. So ECEC has different policy objectives. So we need to consider uh, the varying policy objectives in order for us to consider the spending choices as well. Thank you, Mia. Um, I have another another question is um, at what age should children start ECC? Shouldn't children under the age of three stay at home? That's a productive question. Or yeah, you know, I think this is a, a choice that uh, <clears throat> ultimately families need to make. You know, I think we cannot. Our, our data do not suggest that you know uh, the, the, the child uh, a gender-based child care is necessarily better than. Uh, take children being taken away off at home. But, you know, think back to the data I showed you on, on female labor market participation, uh, simply rising numbers. So many families simply uh, do not have that choice. And um, therefore, I think, and that's where the demand really comes from. And it is important that society steps up its effort. Or you could say that many children grow up in very uh, small families. They may not have the surroundings that will actually stimulate their development in the way that you would wish to. So yes, you know, where parents have a choice, that's a good thing, And um, uh, but uh, it is important, like we do in school. I mean, schooling is, 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 is in a way no different in that, in the sense we, we should ensure that there is provision for children to develop in the way that's best for them. Yes, thank you. As you said, about participation from women. Um, one, I have another question. Uh, many developing countries implement reforms which establish mandatory or guaranteed one year before school. 
Um, but there's just that in these countries we see it's in children in a classroom with desks and blackboards basically repeating their, the first grade of, of proper schooling. How can we avoid this schoolification or simplification of the um, of what they are taught? Yeah, I think that's a very important point, and uh, that's obviously something that we do see in many countries. Uh, it's very easy to extend schooling downwards, and there's a lot of pressures actually that suggest that. Now, for example, sometimes access to primary schooling is, you know, there are screener tests in the developing world, and places are limited, so parents have a natural inclination to, you know, give their children a good academic head start is actually not something that research has shown to be terribly effective. Now, there are simply, as you could see in the initial chart, there are specific periods in which uh, certain developments are taking best care of. So how to, how to you know, prevent that from happening? The first is really you know, to have a good institutional framework, to give the staff who work in those institutions the right training, to give them a good understanding of what holistic and and child-centered education really means and how that's best delivered. So I think really that is hard work, but this is, there is no shortcut to that. Thank and then also to, to eliminate uh, kind of n negative pressures on the system that facilitate this. And I'm particularly talking about screener tests and admission procedures to schools that would favor, you know, a early pressure on academic knowledge and skills. Yes, I think, thank you. Um, in a sense, this is a follow-up question about identifying should or can pre-primary school teachers identify and should they give special treatment to children of disadvantaged families? Yeah, actually, this is something that we have not, it's only marginally captured in, in our, our, our data. But, but, you know, obviously, I think the equity-related considerations uh, are you know almost inversely proportional to the age of children. That's where you can make most of the difference, giving those children an early, with extra support and, and a particularly strong start, which you can then build on in, in primary school. In fact, if you're not doing this uh, in a large class in primary school, it's going to be uh, in, infinitely more difficult to do. But maybe my colleagues have uh, further commentary on this. Yes. Thank you, Andrea. This is a very politically sensitive topic in, in, in fact, but countries have different approaches and countries who are really proactive identifying learning needs, in particular special learning needs, they develop some instruments, but they are very cautious about these instruments too. So it's not really testing, but trying to uh, in a, uh, identify the special learning needs in a more playful um, environment, whereas some countries really do implement some of the um, the uh, triangulation type. So it's not really the uh, test uh, observed by the teachers, but also incorporate some information from parents as well. So it's not really one uh, directed instrument. But it is a very sensitive um, political topic. Thank you. That's interesting. Um, I suppose in a, another question about um, development of a child. What is the relationship between poor language skills in early education years and further performances and success in primary school and onwards? Is there a relation? Well, you know, I think uh, we, we, we don't have specific data on this, but we draw on other research. I mean, language is the foundation for all learning. I mean, most of the learning in school uh, falls through uh, language acquisition, and therefore, if children do not have strong language skills, uh, they'll inevitably fall behind. So this is one of the most important kind of prerequisites that uh, I think early childhood education here uh, really needs to provide. Yes, and, and Andreas, just to support you, in addition to language, literacy, also numeracy, and the self-regulations are also being seen as the uh, one of a uh, few of the strong predictors for the later student outcomes as well. Thank you, Rita. Um, 
I have another question about parental involvement. How, what were the ways that the study saw about the different ways communities and parental involvement in schools? Sorry. Yeah, Mio, you want to comment on that? Sorry, to repeat the question, what are the different ways that community and parents are involved with teachers in the schools? Involve community and parents within teacher parent collaborations or teacher parent involvement in the schools. Are they did the survey come up with the different ways that these are? Yes, so again, uh, I think one of the Andreas slides have shown that how the that there are different ways that the parents are invited or children are invited to visit schools, for example. But again, there's no uh, research to support which works best. And just one point about the, uh, the difference between parental or community engagement at the level of preschool or primary school. Yes, as Andrea said, the pre primer primary schools could do maybe better because the engagement is lower, but it's not only on the side of the primary school, because at that age, maternal employment rate is higher. So actually, we really need to think about how to improve or engage parents who are working, who have less time to actually engage in school activities as well. So the issue is more complex at the level of primary school. Thank you. Um, Some countries have, um, we're talking about more overall systems, some countries have split systems, other have integrated systems. What are the main advantages of each? You know, I think uh, the, how they are, in, the institutional separation is one thing. I think what all countries should aim for, to have them integrated in terms of methods, integrated in terms of curricula, integrated in terms of, you know, uh, Staff development. I think this is where a lot more work can be done. Whether that means you know everything has to be run by one ministry, uh, we don't have a view on that. You know that's obviously makes things easier. But uh, the important thing is where even where things where institutions are run by different sectors, uh, that there is a substantially more collaboration to make sure that we really model learning opportunities around the needs of children rather than pushing children through certain institutional providers. And there is still by far too much fragmentation currently going on, also often in ways that is uh, simply ineffective. And, and the one, you know, what you can see is that every transition becomes a particularly high barrier for the most disadvantaged children. The children of the wealthy families will find their way around it because the parents are going to help them the children from disadvantaged backgrounds, you know, they go from one barrier to the next and often and information is lost at each of those barriers and I think that's where we need to work on. Uh, I think there's also more work required on a kind of, uh, I don't want to say ideological, but sort of philosophical um, level to make sure that both primary and early childhood education institutions develop more of a common understanding about pedagogy, about child development and uh, I think there's still a lot to be done. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Is it more important to raise qualification levels of staff or to decrease group sizes with lower levels of training? Well, that's a great question. I don't think we have a clear answer to this. If we, if we were talking about school, I could actually give you a clear answer. When you look at secondary schools, you know, in PISA age, you know, if ever you have to make a choice between a better teacher in a smaller class, you know, go for the better teacher. Uh, it's not so clear where we can extrapolate that logic straight one-to-one -to, -one to very small children, where naturally the relational aspect is of greater importance. But um, it is, and you could see in the, in the chart that countries do make very different choices here, but uh, my hunch also there would be, you know, uh, that compromising the quality of your staff is uh, incurring a very high price. Thank you. Um, maybe we can have time for one more question. Uh, which as I said, do we have data on um, which countries ensure good working conditions for teachers? What do they do differently from other countries? Maybe, Mio, is that something you'd like to talk about? 
Yes, I think so. In terms of the working conditions, Andreas already has shown the, the data where the salaries are set at the same level for pre primary and primary, uh, pre -primary and primary teachers. And it's not only the salary oftentimes that the ECEC teachers find as good working conditions. As Andrea said, the, the question about the staff to ratio is one as well, in particular for the child care sector. And also the, the qualification is another one that opportunity for the professional development. And it's not only the opportunity for professional development but also whether there are career progress. So after being the ECC teachers, are there any other opportunities besides becoming the centre leaders? So again, the incentive systems and mechanisms are not as far developed in the pre-primary school uh, or ECC sector as a whole than schooling sector. Yes, indeed. And I think a follow-up question is, how should we train preschool children, teachers along their careers? Uh, for me, yes. Yes, so again, if I come back to the question about the transition, the um, training, the teacher transition, so there are emerging the practices of offering the same tra training or joint training. So this, is, this can be even more streamlined. But again, the, we need to look at the multidimensional um, aspects of the working conditions. So if the ECC professionals are busy with their own work, even without any preparatory or planning time, then they may not see such needs in the first place. Again, coming back to the point about the uh, Andreas raised about the perception. So the, the, the sector needs a whole change about the perceptions, including the working conditions, the professional development needs, and the pedagogy. So it needs, it really needs a movement rather than a one aspect is to be changed. And would, it wouldn't make an impact. Okay, well, I think um, we can round up there. Thank you very much to Andres, to Miho, um, and Eric. For, um, thank you. Yes, would you like to? So thank you very much for everybody and thank you for attending and um, good evening. <laughs>